I've written everything down, just in case, and uh, we can, someone can carry on without me. Uh, good, so, um, right, jet lag aside, uh, let me begin at the beginning. Here we go. So, uh, oh, I should also say that much of this is joint work with my student, uh, Alex Wickens. Um, he probably wouldn't mind me taking more of the credit because now he works at the Bank of England, but um, <laughs> uh, honesty impels me to say this. So, uh, let me say what the theorem is, and then during the course of the talk, I'll try and explain what everything means. And then I'll say maybe the most important part of the proof before the end. But most of the proof, um, well, sort of gets a bit lengthy, so I probably won't, well, I definitely won't get through that. So please do ask questions. There's no way that I can finish everything in any case. So if you have a question, feel free. And, and don't feel bad about me not getting through my material, because there's no chance of that. <laughs> OK, so here's the theorem. So um, the space of ending laminations for arcs is homeomorphic, mapping class group equivariantly homeomorphic, to um, the boundary of the arc complex. So let me write it down. There is a mapping class group equivariant homeomorphism from, and uh, actually the direction kind of uh, matters here, from the space of ending laminations or arcs to the Gromov boundary of the arc complex. So there's the theorem in symbols. Here's the theorem in words. And again, my plan is to explain what everything means and give a hint of the proof. Um, and before I get going, maybe uh, credit where credit is due. So this is a variant of Eric Clarke's theorem. Um, which is almost the same. There's a mapping class group equivariant homeomorphism from the space of ending laminations for curves to the Gromov boundary of the curve complex. So it's almost literally the same theorem. You just replace C everywhere by A. And uh, well, uh, not quite the same proof. Um, in fact, our techniques are very different from hers. Uh, she uses tools from Teichmuller theory, and we use uh, train track machinery, which is much more combinatorial. Um, uh, also, our work is inspired by, or sort of uh, follows from, uh, a discussion of Ursula Hammerstadt, who um, Oh, okay, let me not get too deeply into the details just yet, but um, this is also related to various work with uh, uh, Chris Leidiger, Richard Kent, Mohan Mish. Um, it's also related to, uh, or hopefully should lead on to work similar to that of David Gabbais. He proves that the boundary of the curve complex is highly connected, so one could obviously ask similar questions about, once, now that you have a homeomorphic model, one could ask questions, similar questions about the boundary of the art complex. Um, and also, uh, that's not why I'm here saying this. Um, I attended a conference at AIM um, all about uh, various things, about the Lipschitz metric on Teichmuller space. 
And um, Francois Guerito was talking about how you can parameterize the space of deformations of, well, flat space times using the arc complex. And I said, oh, well, you know, Kaiser and I, Kaiser Rafi and I talked about the boundary of the arc complex a long time ago. Is that interesting? And he said, oh, yes, you must write this down. So uh, this is partially motivated by Francois Guerito telling me to do that. So I think that's all the credit apportioned in the various directions. If I've left your name off, please just let me know. No, Chris, I mentioned your name already. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, you're actually coughing. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> OK, well, in that case, I'll move on. So um, let me just start at the beginning, and then I'll go on until I get to the end. So fix S equal SGN, a compact connected. Oh, I have the great luxury of going first. Thank you very much, organizers, by the way. So um, in addition to the fact that I plan on falling asleep after my talk due to jet lag, um, that means I also get to say uh, various basic notational issues, which makes me very happy. OK, a compact connected, oriented. <coughs> Surface naturally of genus G with N. I can't see you, so you should come in quickly and sit down. With N equals number of boundary components. Um, let's say, as an example, here we have the surface of genus 3 with two boundary components. So this is S32. Um, so the crucial, there's many crucial definitions. Maybe this is the oldest. I guess that's the oldest. A curve or arc, let's say alpha in S, is essential if it does not cut off a disk or an S from S. So here's my surface again. Maybe this time it only has to use two. So the red guys are bad guys. These are not essential. And here, this curve right there and that curve right there, those are both bad. We don't like them, right? Oh, uh, and this, this curve here, this arc here is also bad. Because this cuts off an anus, that cuts off a disc, that cuts off a disc. Green, green is good. Here's this curve. That's essential. And here's an essential arc. Why, why don't I go around the back here, like so. There. The green guys are essential. Check, check. And the red guys are not. So? Yes. You invited people to ask obnoxious questions. So what if you start in the bottom? Uh, puncture, loop around the top puncture and come back down. It cuts off an angle. But do you want to count that as an essential an arc? Cutting oh, out. oh, I see, I see what you mean. Um, that's essential. So um, the question was this, which it like so, and I believe that. Uh, you are correct. Okay, fine. So, really cuts off a region. So this is green, so it's also okay. Okay. Of uh, non-negative Euler characteristic. And I'll put it in quotes. Right, so this one has Euler characteristic 1, this has Euler characteristic 0. This has Euler characteristic how much? A bygone. It has Euler characteristic a half, because the disk when it's got two corners. Um, this guy's OK, because the Euler characteristic, Euler characteristic minus a half. And we have to count Euler characteristic the right way. So I won't uh, dwell on that. But uh, I think that that's the only, um, I found the only loophole in my clever way of avoiding talking about that. 
All right, so um, let's define AC of S, a graph. With, let's say the vertices are proper isotopy classes of essential R2 curves, and the edges are uh, pairs with disjoint. Representatives. So again, always good to have an example in mind. So here are my three good guys. There's an essential arc, here's an essential curve, and there's another essential curve. So everything is essential, and they're all pairwise disjoint and distinct. So I get a little triangle in the complex of arcs and curves, like so. In other words, we take the topological information and we turn it into something combinatorial, right? We take the things that topologists are interested in, um, in low dimensions, namely simple arcs and curves, and we turn them into something that is a combinatorialist's dream that has lots of combinatorial structure we can now talk about. Well, let's talk about it. Define the distance in the arc and curve complex between alpha and beta, this is um, the minimal number of edges in a minimal edge path from alpha to beta. And uh, we just remark Again, I was trying to be quick, maybe too quick, to find the subgraphs uh, A of S and C of S uh, in the same way for arcs slash curves. Right, so I take the subgraph of the arc and curve graph, which is just the arcs, or which is just the curves. And uh, I think the curve complex is the most famous of these, uh, due to the work of Mazur and Minsky, but uh, these other guys are interesting as well. The arc and curve complex is just sort of interesting in a technical point of view, but the arc complex is really different. Um, so let's just say a few facts. Well, know that this curve complex is connected. Fact: uh, C of S is connected. Yes. Um, locally infinite. So these two are just exercises, and here's something which is a little more challenging: has infinite time. Um, also true of A of S, A, C of S. Um, and actually, if you want to do these exercises, then maybe for the first two, you should think about the arc complex because it's mo the most immediate for that one. You have to maybe think just a little bit harder to prove the connectivity of the curve complex. But it's still something that's eminently good. Does that answer your question? I'm to figure out this infinite diameter thing. Yeah, that's the harder one. Oh. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll say, uh, if you remind me, I'll say something. I'll try and address that point a little bit. Good. So um, these are the facts. Um, and they're maybe not so difficult, although this one is, is nice. So let's make a definition. A geodesic metric space, um, let's say x dx, 
is delta hyperbolic. <coughs> if every geodesic triangle Let's say T equals P union Q union R is delta slim. So here's a picture of that. So I have to end at 3, but is that US time or is that UK time? You keep taking long over. <laughs> um, right, so here's a picture. Here are P, Q, and R, and here are delta neighborhoods of P, Q, and we're going to the delta neighborhoods of P and Q, i.e., R, the third side, is contained in the delta neighborhood of the first two sides, P, U, and Q. So this is what slimness means. Right? And if you're delta hyperbolic, then every triangle has to be delta slim for the same delta. One uniform delta, one fixed delta. Like so. So here's a theorem. Um, well, C of S is delta hyperbolic. That's due to Mazur and Minsky. And here's another theorem, which maybe is not going to be a surprise which is the arc curve, the arc complex is delta hyperbolic. And that's due to Mazur and myself. But here's another theorem. Which is um, due to Sebastian Hensel. Now I did not practice, so I have to just read my notes. Go to Przysky. I hope the other speakers will take a lesson in practice <laughs> writing and spelling his name before their talk. And Richard Webb. I guess I said that Alex was my student, so I get to say that Richard is also my student. And their theorem is that the delta for the arc complex is less than or equal to 7. So notice what the theorem says here. This is uniform. doesn't matter what s is. The constant of hyperbolicity for the arc complex is just 7. And they use this, which is a bit of a surprise, they use this to get control, uniform control of the delta hyperbolicity of the curve complex as well. Um, delta for the curve complex is less than or equal, I believe 17 is the current best uh, And uh, there's actually other people who have versions of this result, but this is the, the best to date, and their proof is by far the simplest. So, um, Although there's virtue in the other proofs as well. <laughs> so, so Yes. What about if you take all one magnitudes? Like why arcs or curves? Why not do um, everything together? Like if you take all arcs and curves, can you also make a complex? Is it also a yeah, curve complex? You make the arc curve complex. Oh, it's, so it's really all curves. So it's not really close, it's really all. It's all curves. Oh, wait, well, so. okay. Uh, well, one manifolds are classified. Yeah, okay. I know you're a high dimensional topologist, so, so, so you may not know this. Curves are within close. Yes, yes, yes. So there's loops and see. there's arcs. Those are all the possible one manifolds. Okay. And then if you want to take them several at a time, then that's just talking about sort of maybe higher dimensional cells in the complex. Okay. I've only defined the one skeleton, but you could define the higher dimensional cells. Do you get to know the delta hyperbolicity constant for the arc and curve? Yeah, complex? that's irritating. Um, unfortunately, the one skeleton is not uniformly quasi-isometric to the whole complex. Oh. So it's probably. I mean, adding these extra simplicities, they should make like better, not worse. Oh, oh, but think, there could be shortcuts, so you don't know. They, they haven't proved that. I think you're answering a different question. You're saying oh. if you put in the simplicities. I'm yeah. saying look at the arc and curve complex. Look at the arc and curve complex. So that's hyperbolic. That's um, uniformly quasi-isometric to the curve complex. Mm -hmm. So when, as soon as you figure out the, that constant of quasi-isomorphicity, then you can, and then you go through the proof that delta hyperbolicity is invariant under quasi isometry, yeah. and then you'll get a uniform constant for the arc curves as well. Um, yeah, I thought you were asking about putting in the higher That's uh, none of the experts seem to be interested in that question. So maybe some someone enterprising grad student should 
write it up and have an instant paper. Okay, so that's the first space, the art complex. Oh, sorry, no, 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 I'm not quite there yet, am I? So, part two. Boundaries. So, um, excellent. If x dx is delta hyperbolic, we define the boundary at infinity of x. This is the Gromov boundary. And what is this? This is, um, let's say, p mapping n to x such that p is a quasi-geodesic. But we have to mod out p is equivalent to q if their images have bounded house resistance. So let me just say what a quasi-geodesic is. Here, p mapping n to x is a quasi-geodesic if for all a and b in n, it's actually a quasi-geodesic ray, but let me not stand on formality, if uh, for all a and b we have the following inequalities. a minus b, that's less, oh, it's a L plus b. This is less than, so this is the distance in the source, so it has to be bounded above by the distance of the image. So it's just saying that the, that the map isn't too wide. It doesn't stretch things too much. And conversely, it doesn't shrink things too much either. So the other inequality is almost exactly the same, just with the source of the target first. OK, so. Um, we are not allowed to shrink things too much, and we're not allowed to stretch things too much. And if I got it backwards, then just switch the order in which I touch the black one. Um, so there's no, I like drawing pictures, obviously. There's not really a good picture. What is it? People sort of draw things like that. Here's a round disk. That's a hyperbolic space. And then they draw a wiggly line, like so. There's P. Right? So it's not necessarily straight, but it's on the whole, or coarsely, the straight. And then the equivalence class of P, that's going to define a point at infinity. So that is the first space. Um, let me just give a quick example. Let's say T3 is the three male tree. Let me draw a picture of that for you. But I'll draw it in a suggestive way. So here's the three male tree, and I've drawn it inside the point gray disk, and you see that it's um, all any infinite ray in the three male tree is tending to some point of the boundary of the hyperbolic disk, like so. So T3 is 0 hyperbolic. In other words, if you have a geodesic triangle, it's always a tripod. Triangles never have any body in trees, right? When I drew uh, this hyperbolic triangle right here, there was a little, there was three legs, and then there was a little body right there. So hyperbolicity says that the body is always uniformly bounded. But in trees, the body is just a point. That's what zero hyperbolicity means. And the boundary at infinity of T3 is a cantor symbol. 
which I was trying to indicate here. Um, I guess I'm, I'm not giving all the details. In other words, you can cook up, and I won't go through the details here, um, you can cook up a natural topology on the boundary, which is coming from a visual metric, in some sense. Or, because there's many different visual metrics, so they all get the same topology. Right? So, the, the, with what I've done so far, you can prove as an exercise that the boundary is uncountable, and then once you topologize it, you'll see that it's a Okay, so that's the first space done. Let's go on to the next space. I have to tell you about any languages. So we have this sort of combinatorial and uh, uh, synthetic geometry side over here. So now we're going to have some uh, topology slash uh, hyperbolic geometry over here. A lamination, lambda contained in S, um, let's say where S is equipped with a hyperbolic, with a hyperbolic metric. or the complex of arcs. So it wants to be a limit of curves. This is the notion due to Thurston. A lamination. actually many arcs which are running together in some parallel families. Not exactly parallel because it's hyperbolic geometry, but pretty close as you zoom in and things get more and more Euclidean. And then what if I, I should have said Simple. So these guys no longer have to be compact geodesics. Okay? The leaves of the lamination don't have to be compact. The lamination is a closed subset, so it's compact. But the leaves don't have to be. And typically you see this infinite spiral in behavior. <laughs> these are what occur naturally as the limits, as the Hausdorff limits of simple closed curves. So it's somehow reasonable that they should be at infinity of the complex of curves or the complex of arcs. Um, we can make that uh, more precise. Oh, and now it's time to answer your question. You asked, how does one prove that it has infinite diameter? Well, what you can do is you can pick one of these laminations, a special one. I haven't given all the details yet. Um, and then try and find a sequence of curves that approximates it better and better. And that set of curves will prove that it has infinite diameter. They'll have to exit. So that uh, is an idea due to Kobayashi. It's 
Okay, so um, more about laminations. Definition: lambda is minimal if it has no non-trivial sublamination. So here's a boring example. Example: um, a simple closed curve. A simple closed GS. Let me add uh, something to the definition here. Lambda intersect the boundary of S equals the empty set. Good. So um, as we've seen, it's really hard to draw uh, actual laminations which aren't simple closed curves, but that's my, my best attempt. Um, let's make another um, definition. So EL. A of S, this is the set of minimal laminations lambda in S such that uh, lambda intersects alpha is non empty for all arcs alpha. Uh, here's an example. Actually, there's an example there, but let me just Quickly draw it again. So any arc it has to start at the boundary, it has to leave the boundary and come back. Okay? You can't stay right next to the boundary because then you'd be cutting off a disk. So it has to cross this subsurface. So if I draw a lamination that fills up this subsurface, such that anything crossing the subsurface has to meet it, then I'm good to go. So I just do that. Um, I just sort of spiral around the waist for a while until I get bored. Then I go up here, then I come down here, then I spiral back down, carefully missing myself, then I go down here, then I spiral back up like so. Um, lambda fills the subsurface x, so all, this is the subsurface x right here, this is s. So all arcs meet and So that subsurface X is sufficiently important to get its own name. So I'll call it the footprint of lambda. X equals footprint is the smallest um, surface with um, what do we have? Lambda is contained in X and the boundary of X is GS. There haven't been any questions in a while, so I'm slightly concerned. I was trying not to, not to get too worried, but now finally uh, I've become worried. So what's going on? Here's this crazy lamination, all right? We see that um, this lamination sort of sees all arcs. Because any arc that wants to exist has to cross this lamination, has to cross x. So they have some sort of interaction. It doesn't see all curves, right? There are curves over here which are disjoint from this lamination. That's the difference, actually. I haven't gone into the details, but that's the difference between any laminations for arcs and any laminations for curves. Any laminations for curves, they have to go everywhere because they have to see all curves. 
any laminations for arcs, there's more of them. If you see all curves, you see all arcs. But if you see all arcs, you might miss some curves. Okay? So this is a bigger space. So just, I haven't made the definition, but just as a remark. See, I went off script. That always makes people more interested. Uh, here's a remark, which is the ending laminations for curves is a strict subset of the ending laminations for arcs. Are there other questions before I go on? <laughs> so that's the most simple to edit to what's going on? Well, so not exactly. I would say duality. Um, maybe it's more that x, the footprint of lambda, sees all arcs. And hence, there's this information. Yeah, um, there is something to what you say, right? The in intersection number plays an important role in everything that's going on. Um, but I wouldn't say exactly it's a duality. I would say that um, x is a limit, sorry, x. Uh, lambda is a limit of arcs in an interesting way. But it's not a l limit of curves in an interesting way. I mean, it is a limit of curves, because um, all laminations, uh, as I've defined them, are limits of curves but not in an interesting way. Are there other questions? Yes? Is it true, or just to clarify, or maybe it's not true, that, okay, so this any lamination of curves is the strict subset of the any lamination of arcs. Is it the same as the ending lamination of arcs where the footprint is the whole surface? Yes, um, if I understood, yes, um, remark. If the footprint of lambda equals s, then lambda is called filling. So I usually, uh, like, just for the purpose of this talk, I'll say filling for curves. Or maybe I should say ending. Right? And, and now you see why this is a subset, right? These are the guys that fill all of this. These are the guys that fill any subsurface. Well, I'll say it. So if, um, if lambda is an EL A of S, then what do we know? The footprint of lambda contains um, boundary S. That's if and only, right? What's that? Is that if and only? Uh, if and only. Assuming that lambda is minimal. So you have a minimal lamination, and it's filling for arcs if and only if its footprint is one of these good guys. That's its problem. Um, yes? So does the century close geodesic have a footprint or not? Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> the back, the back. So no, it doesn't really, right? What it, its footprint wants to be an annulus. But if it has to have geodesic boundary, then it has to be an annulus of zero width. So, but oh, uh, those are never ending. So I don't really have to worry about them. Right? Those are never filling for arcs. Right? A simple yeah, yeah, closed yeah. curve can't hit all arcs. Unless it's a boundary component, but then it's not essential. But they're also easy to understand. They're easy to understand, but they aren't, they're not going to be an infinity place. Yeah. Never know. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, part four, brain tracks. You can sort of uh, leave the talk happy now, right? I defined the um, boundary of the arc complex. It's delta hyperbolic, so it has this Gromov hyperbolic boundary. And I defined the space of ending laminations. So you know what all the objects are in the talk. So I've at least said what everything is. They're just sets. I haven't given the topologies yet, but you can figure out what the topology should be. The visual topology for one and the topology of overconvergence or superconvergence for the other. Whatever that means. Doesn't matter. Okay? So the rest of the talk is devoted to saying why they're homeomorphic. Right? I have to find some natural way of turning a lamination into an infinite sequence of arcs. Okay? So I'm going to use train track machinery to do that. But uh, uh, and it takes, it's, there, there's some technicalities, but 
but at least at this point in the talk, you know what all the objects in play are. Okay, so train tracks. Tau in S is a graph, a smooth graph, locally modeled on, here's a chunk of S, and here's what tau looks like, there, this is a bit of tau. So either it's one dimensional and you're nice and smooth and moving along, or it meets this place where it's got a vertex, the graph has a vertex, and it's still smooth there, right? It's got one incoming and two outgoing edges, and we have a direction at that point. Um, call, branch, call edges, branches. These definitions are also due to Thurston, and vertices, switches. So like here's a branch, here's a branch, and here's a branch, and right there is a switch. Right, they're branches because they're like train, train, they're branches of a train line, and they're switches because that's when the train gets to make a choice and go one direction or the other direction. Something like that. Okay, so um, a transverse measure I have to connect train tracks to um, laminations, so we do it the following way. A transverse measure mu is a function on the branches to the non-negative reals. P e tau equals branches. Um, is a function satisfying So at every, at every branch, I have some weight, and the sum of the weights has to behave in the right way. The stuff coming in has to equal the total of the stuff going out <coughs> at all switches. So let me just draw the picture which is supposed to explain what's going on. Here's a block of height mu a. So I replace this switch by just a rectangle a foliated rectangle, and here's a block of height mu b. I replace the branch again by another foliated rectangle, and here's a block of height mu c, like so. So these uh, heights match up. So every, um, and I glue things by, let's say, isometry. So <coughs> the, the point that's distance epsilon from the top here gets mapped to the point which is distance epsilon from the top here. Okay, yes? This is a local model. So it keeps going and going, yeah, no, the train track isn't allowed to touch the boundary. Yeah. Um, write that somewhere. Tau intersect boundary S equals MT set. And this uh, assumption that there's no uh, boundary points is the same as my assumption that my laminations have no boundary points. Okay? So those are the same thing. I'm going to have a transverse measure, and what I do is I take these rectangles, these foliated rectangles, and they, I know how they glue together by the switch condition, by the fact that this equality is satisfied, so then I just pull them tight to make them geodesics. And I lose some measure zero set where I don't know what to do, like there's the leaf that starts right here and goes that way. I don't quite know what to do with that one, so I just throw those away. So, Transverse measures give laminations by point. Genesis of laminations is not the measured topology? What's that? Uh, your topology of laminations is not by the measured topology? There are sort of two natural topologies on laminations. There's the measured topology, um, which I'll discuss in just a moment. 
And there's also this uh, topology of overconvergence or superconvergence. Chabotin? Um, I always forget what the Chabotin topology is. Basically, Hausdorff. Yes. So the, the, the superconvergence is basically Hausdorff convergence. Um, and the problem is that minimal laminations could Hausdorff converge to something that's not minimal. So you have to throw away the non minimal. You have to throw away the right part. Um, so those topologies are not the same. They're very different, actually. And we're interested in both of them. So let me try and say that with some words here. Um, a train track tau gives leads to p tau. This is the polyhedron of measures on tau. Actually, they're projective measures, but anyway. <coughs> so let me just draw a picture of that. Here it is. Here's p tau. So we need um, sequences of these things. So here are splittings, section 5. And in the interest of time, I'll just draw a giant picture of what this looks like. So I had a local model of a train track over there. So here's a local model of a splitting. We see two switches, and they're facing each other. <coughs> And there's three ways to split. You can either split left. You can have a collision or a central splitting. Or you can split right. And naturally, the right splitting is the mirror image of left split. So this is a track tau, and it gives a track sigma. So notice. If um, sigma is a split of tau, then uh, p sigma is contained in p tau. So maybe I have a picture of that here. So here's p tau. And once I split, I lose some of the measures. Right? Any measure uh, or any let me say it another way. If lambda is an element of p tau, i.e. there's a transverse measure uh, on tau such that when you uh, pull it tight, you get lambda say lambda is carried by tau. So if sigma, if lambda is carried by sigma, a split of tau, then lambda is carried by tau. And that's what this picture is supposed to sort of uh, tell you. And you can see, right, if lambda runs along the train track for sigma, um, every simple geodesic uh, of lambda is running very close to be parallel to the branches of sigma, then you can just move it a little bit, and it's also carried by tau. And the opposite I mean, is not true. In general. So we're getting close to um, our map. There's one definition left. Sorry, is lambda for you a measure or? Yeah, so I cheat a little. Lambda is the lamination, and I am not paying attention to the measure. Okay, when I say that something's carried, I just mean that it emits a, a measure such that that measure is a, a measure on. But there, there's actually more to it than that. There's a carrying map, but let me not go into those details. So here's the definition. Or maybe now is a good moment to back out of the technicalities and just remember what's going on. I define three of the two spaces. I need to give a map between them. In other words, I need to turn a lamination into uh, a point at infinity. 
And a point in infinity is an equivalence class of quasi-geodesics. So I need to turn a lamination into a quasi-geodesic. So we're very close to doing that. Train tracks carry laminations. And a lamination looks a little bit like a simple closed curve, not really. Um, so as soon as I get a sequence of train tracks, then I'll be very close to being done. So a sequence tau i is a sequence to lambda if, well, what do we have? One. It needs to be a reasonable sequence. Tau i plus one is a split of tau i. OK, so that's just some basic, it's not some crazy random collection of train tracks. They're actually each related to the next by splitting. Lambda is carried by tau i, for all i. And finally, three, um, infinitely many of the splittings, infinitely many of the splits occur in the footprint of land. So um, what does it mean to occur in? I don't have time to say it, but this is some sort of non-triviality uh, assumption. Okay? And I think there's even an example on the board. There's no example on the board, so I'll draw one. train track, and you'll notice that my train tracks look suspiciously like uh, laminations. <coughs> this stuff doesn't matter so much. Perhaps something like that. So let me break my surface up into pieces. Here's x, and here's y. So notice what I could do. I have some lamination, lambda, that's carried just on this part of the train track. So now, I could get a splitting sequence in two ways. I could always split this part of the train track according to the instructions that lambda gives me. Right? Anytime I have, a, uh, anytime I have two switches facing each other, uh, lambda expresses this preference about what kind of splitting to do. So I could split the part of the train track that matters, the part that carries lambda, or I could split this boring part over here forever. So the first way is an honest splitting sequence, which is actually going towards lambda in some way that I'll define. And the second one is cheating. That's not allowed. So this point is um, maybe kind of new or overlooked. When, lambda, when the footprint of lambda is s, then this is backwards. OK? So if you want to get a splitting sequence to an ending lamination for the whole surface, just do, any, just do the splittings that lambda, that lambda requires of you, and eventually you'll get there. But uh, when you're just uh, filling up a portion of the surface, then you have to be a little more careful. All right. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Do you assume any conditions on the complement of the train track? I do, but I omitted. I forgot. I, no, this I is stuff like that. Uh, again, it's this Euler characteristic. Okay. Every complementary region has to have a negative Euler characteristic counted correctly. And also, the train track has to be compact. And you can't have finite, right? Yeah, finite. Other questions? OK, so I've gotten a splitting sequence. I need to turn the, I have a splitting sequence to lambda. So if I start with lambda, that's the input to the map. So now I have the splitting sequence. I now need to produce a quasi-geodesic of arcs. So let me do that for you. Definition. Um, a arc alpha and s is dual to um, tau, and we write it alpha is dual to tau, 
because it's sort of like the complement of being carried by tau, although not quite. Um, if alpha is transverse to tau and there are no bindings. So here's the picture. Here is tau, and here is a bit of alpha. And this bad region right here, that's a bad region. So if you have an arc, and it's transverse but not dual, then what you can do is you can try and pull it tight, and pull it tight, and get rid of the bygones. And uh, if you're lucky, and you know you got enough sleep last night, then this should end with it being dual. And if you're unlucky, then it might end up with it being like almost carry. Uh, and then if you're really unlucky, it might be with it being someplace in between being dual and carry. And then uh, there's a whole theory about when that happens. But this is enough for us. We just need duality. A dual arc alpha is y if, um, let's see here. Two things. We need that alpha is contained in the foot print of tau, which is defined in the same way as the footprint for lambda, and alpha intersects R is less than or equal to 2 for all regions R contained in S minus 2. Okay, so this is like, um, here's a dual arc. And this one is even wide. There. Okay, it needs it just once, and there's no bygones. That's this. And uh, it's contained in the footprint, well, because here the footprint is everything. But if I erase this stuff, it would still be in the footprint, because the footprint would be x. So the point is that we're now just about done. Lemma w tau, oh, uh, suppose Lambda is contained in EL A of S, and Lambda is carried by tau, then um, W tau equals the set of wide arcs is finite uniformly and actually Um, uniformly bounded diameter in A of S. Okay, so this lemma is the lemma that turns train tracks into arcs. Okay? So now we have the machinery of the proof. Oh, um, and W tau is not empty. So finally, part seven, I hope, the map, V, which takes an ending lamination for arcs and turns it into a point of the boundary of the arc complex. So there's, we need to take uh, lambda, so um, I guess I don't need the brackets. I need to take an ending lamination lambda and I need to turn it into a equivalence class of quasi geodesic And I think I'll, oh, okay, so just uh, in the 30 seconds remaining, why don't I just say the following, um, pick any um, tau i sequence to lambda, then w tau i, let me write it this way. Then the map, let's call it b, uh, then i, it's mapped to W tau i 
let's call this Q lambda, is a, a uniform reparameterized cross in AMS. So finally, lambda goes to the equivalence class of Q lambda. That's the map P. I have a lamination. Somehow, I cook up a sequence of train tracks which is splitting towards lambda. That gives me a quasi geodesic in the arc complex by taking the wide arcs. That's my map. Um, I was going to prove the well definedness of this map because I made a huge choice here, right? I chose the tau i. There's lots of ways of choosing the tau i. So the first step is to prove it's well defined, right? And then you want to prove that it's injective. And then you want to prove it's surjective. And then you want to prove that it's continuous. And then you want to prove it's open. Then you want to take a very long nap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? So, so um, can you prove Caroline's theorem the same way? I mean, yes, that was, that was, that's Alexander Wickens' thesis. Okay, and that's written down. And that's, but that's a different approach than what she did. That's a different approach than what she did, yes, that's right. Um, yeah. So it's free of type theory? It is, well, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yes, it is free of type theory, but it is full of train track. Okay. It's a feature. It's a feature. Are there any other questions? Let's thank Saul again. And there is coffee and fruit upstairs in the room.